The word home brings up a whole host of memories, feelings, and different associations. For people hitting, sitting here in this church today, for some the feelings are warm and fuzzy, for others the feelings are hurt and angry. Home, it's all contained in that one word. It might mean togetherness, it might mean pain and separateness. Home. What are your associations when you hear the word home? Do you think intact or broken? Do you think happy or angry? Do you think loving, supportive parents? Or do you think family cut off? There is within each of us this yearning for home. A place to which we can go, a place where we can be accepted, where we can be loved, where we can be taken in just as we are. That's home. It's within us everywhere we go. Not too long ago, we were on an airline flight. I was reading or doing something. Anita had been watching some in-flight information and entertainment on the screen right in front of her. She suddenly turned to me and she said, do you know what the most stressful number of children to have is? I said, no. What is it? She said, three. I said, three. She said, yep. Especially when you left home at four. <laughs> I said, well, that makes sense. And then she said to me, do you know where the best place to have kids is? I said, no, where? She said, Finland. I said, really? She said, you know what the worst place to have kids is? I said, no, what is it? She said, high school. <laughs> So well, here we are, jetting through the sky, still learning about home. Well, that's what we're going to do this camp meeting series. We're turning our hearts toward home. Now, the way that we're going to do this is that we're going to meander through the house, take note of different rooms, locations, furniture in the house, and just ask the question, what does this space, this area, this place tell us about living as a family at home? So today, we begin in the kitchen. In the kitchen. In fact, early this week, I was having a phone conversation with my mom, and she asked me, Rand, what is the sermon title for this week? And I said, kitchen. She said, kissing? I said, no, <laughs> no, mom, not kissing, kitchen. She said, kissing in the kitchen? I said, mom, she said, oh, wow, you're going to pack them in with titles like that. I talked to her again yesterday afternoon. She said to me, I'm still looking forward to that sermon. <laughs> so, Mom, here we go with kissing in the kitchen. <laughs> kitchen. You know what the kitchen is like. It's the place where the hub of activity happens. Kids come home from school. Where do they go? To the kitchen, open the refrigerator, see what's in there. Parents come home from work. Where do they go? Go to the kitchen, drop stuff on the counter, look around, something to drink, something to munch on. Kitchen. Guests come over. They make their way to the kitchen. They stand there and they look at what's on the refrigerator door. Oh, is that your sister? Are those her kids? Oh, my goodness, they have grown. Kitchen. It's the place. In fact, when you have people over, says a friend of mine, don't hang out in the living room. Hang out in the kitchen. Because the living room is not where you hear, he says, the real stories. No, in the living room, it's, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? How's work going? It's going great. The guy's about to lose his job, but he doesn't say that. It's going great. But you go to the kitchen, and there, over preparations, over munching and eating and drinking together, the real stories emerge. Kitchen. That's really the heart of the home. In fact, I have this snapshot memory in my mind. I must have been 15, 14 years old. We were living in Guadalajara, Mexico, and the, dad, and the church my dad pastored at the time had invited Morris Vinden to come for a week of devotion. It was a wonderful week, even at my younger age. I realized there is something powerful about this message. But do you know the snapshot I have in my mind? It's the snapshot of when Elder Vinden came over to our house to eat. My mother was in the kitchen, and she was frying patacones. Now, some of you know what patacones are. The rest of you will pray for meaning to come into your life. It's actually green plantains that are sliced and fried, and oh my goodness, they are so good. I have this picture, this image in my mind of mom standing there frying patacones and Maury Vinden standing there eating them as fast as they came out of the pan. And I remember 
even as a child thinking, now he really feels at home. The kitchen. It's really the center of the home, the heart of the home, I would argue. And so today we begin in the kitchen. Now, while we're here in the kitchen, I ought to ask you a question. And that's the question. If the kitchen is the hub of activity, the heart of the home, where we go to get nurtured and to connect and to stay in touch, if that's the heart of the home, then what is the heart of the emotional home, the heart of the spiritual home? What is the heart of that home? I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in just a moment where I think a statement is made that gives us the true heart of the home. Now, I have to give you a bit of background because this statement in Scripture is stunning. It's a stunning statement. The background is this. As we look at the scene, we see three women huddled together. They have been walking down the path. But as they have walked, they have leaned on one another for support. As we hone in on them and focus and see, we can see that they are weeping, they are grieving. All three of them seem to be heartbroken and bereft. We look at them. One is a bit older. Two are younger. And as we observe, we realize this is a mother-in-law and her two daughters-in-law. We listen as the mother-in-law says to them, go back, go back. There's nothing up ahead. The only thing on this pathway is sorrow. In fact, when I get home, I'm going to tell them to call me Mara because that means bitterness. Her husband has died. Her two sons have died. Died in a foreign land, the land to which they had gone to save themselves in the midst of famine back in Israel. And now she has turned her footsteps toward home because there is nothing left back there, but the sad reality is there is nothing meeting her up there. So she turns and she says to them, Go home. I have nothing to offer you. Find husbands among your own people, and may God be with you. Now one daughter-in-law named Orpah finally listens to her mother-in-law and turns her footsteps back toward home. But the other, Ruth, clings to her mother-in-law. And as she does so, she speaks to her words that are stunning in their content. They're really immortal words. You've no doubt heard them before. But when you've heard them, you may have heard them at a wedding altar. You may have thought somebody penned these words as a very special set of wedding vows. But not so. The thing, when we read these words, we have to continue to remind ourselves is these are not words spoken by doe-eyed new spouses to each other. These are words spoken by a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. Ruth chapter 1 contains the words. I read from Ruth 1 beginning in verse 16. This is just after Naomi has said go back. Ruth replies and says, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Those words, I would suggest to you, contain the heart of the relational, emotional, spiritual home. That heart is contained in three promises that Ruth makes to her mother-in-law, Naomi. The first promise is this. I will go with you. I will go with you. In fact, you heard it in the words of verse 16 where she says to Naomi, don't urge me. Stop urging me to go back. Stop telling me to return. Why? Because I will go with you. Now consider what that means. That means that into the darkness 
of Naomi's bitterness and tragedy and trauma and sorrow and sadness. Her daughter-in-law says, you will not go alone. I will go with you. We have a word for that in the English language. And the word is commitment. Commitment. That's the first promise she makes. I'll go with you. But she makes a second promise in these verses. She says, I'll be with you. You noticed it in the rest of verse 17 where she says, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. I will be with you. I cannot imagine a more trying, difficult time than the death of a husband and two sons. I cannot imagine a deeper darkness, a more bereft experience. I can't imagine a time when somebody would feel more utterly forsaken and alone. But into that steps a daughter-in-law who says, I'm not just going with you. I will be with you. Some who study human beings suggest that one of the deepest fears we human beings have is the fear of abandonment. The fear that we'll be left alone. And then some who study the Bible suggest that maybe that's why God so many times uttered the words, I am with you. When you pay attention, you find those words scattered throughout Scripture, such as Isaiah, where God, speaking through the prophet, says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. It's that assurance But you know, as precious is the assurance that God will be with us, there are times when the darkness is so real that we need a promise with skin on it. Into that void steps Ruth. And she says, I will be with you. We have a word for that in English. And the word is commitment. Three promises. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. But then she makes a third promise in her words to her mother-in-law. She says, I'll stay with you. You caught those words in verse 17. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. In other words, I will stay with you all the way to the very end of life. Always. Have you noticed I've noticed we live in an area where there are many people who move here from other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Have you noticed that even when we move, even when we live somewhere, sometimes for a very long time, there arises within us as we contemplate that moment when time meets eternity, there arises within us this yearning for home home, to know that we will come to a final resting place on this mortal coil at our home, our place, where we in our hearts say, this is where I belong. It is to that deep yearning that Ruth speaks. She says to Naomi, I know it seems like there's nothing left. I know it seems like you will have no one to close your eyes in death to care for you at the end. But I give you my word here today, I'll stay with you all the way to the end and beyond because where you will be buried, there will I be buried as well. When I worked as a chaplain, two of the units on which I worked for many years were both oncology units. I watched it time and time and time again as those final moments loomed and lingered. There was a yearning to be there, to know that somebody says, I will stay with you. We have a word for that. And the word is commitment. Now I remind you, 
As we think of these words of Ruth, we are tempted to go to wedding altars. It's appropriate. It's certainly germane to that experience as well. But these words of Ruth are far wider and broader than that. They are words for daughters-in-law to mothers-in-law, for fathers to sons, for brothers to sisters, for children to parents. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. I'll stay with you. Always. I know a couple, you know the kind of couple, beautiful. She's petite, striking, luscious hair. He's tall, buff, handsome, great on the basketball court. Why can't I play like that? Striking couple. It's the kind of couple that if you're honest with yourself, when you look at them, a question runs through your mind. Are they... Beautiful because they're in love? Or are they in love because they're beautiful? And you wonder, is it the second? And if so, what happens when this mortal body fades and rusts? They think they have the answer. It's their song, they say, their song. Now, curiously, it's an old song, very old song. The words were penned by Irving Berlin. It was crooned to us by Frank Sinatra. These are the words of their song. I'll be loving you always. With a love that's true, always. When the things you've planned need a helping hand, I will understand always, always. Days may not be fair always. That's when I'll be there always, not for just an hour, not for just a day, not for just a year, but always. And you look and wonder. Now we know it. Intuitively we know it. And some experientially know it. You know that in a broken, fractured world, commitments come to an end. The truth is some come, come to an end tragically and undesired, and some, in all honestly, honesty, need to come to an end. So I, I have a word. In fact, I have three brief words for those of you who have experienced the hard edge of a broken, a crushed commitment in the family. I speak not just of marriage, though that may be one, but I speak to people here today who are so cut off from family that you haven't spoken in years. Three words. First, if you have broken commitment, marital or otherwise, if you have crushed the commitment, broken a promise, God fully and freely forgives and restores. That's his business. He walks the aisles and the pews of this church this morning just looking for people who find themselves in that place. And there before you he lingers and he says, I have an eraser in my hand. I'm eager to expunge the record, to forgive and to restore. So if you know that in your life, rest assured, God has you in mind. He wants to not only forgive the past, but give you a future. That's the first word. Second word, if you today find yourself teetering on the brink, just at the edge of the precipice, it could end today, this week, next week. May I ask you, don't be hasty. Don't be too hasty. As I have watched the pendulum, even in my lifetime, it has swung. There was a day and time when certain commitments, be they to family or be they to marriage, sometime persisted longer than they ought to have persisted because of the brokenness contained in the relationship. I'm talking brokenness, adultery, and addiction, and abuse, people being seriously and deeply damaged and endangered. And in time past, there was a tendency at times to stay too long and increase the damage. But it seems to me that the pendulum has swung. 
And that now the tendency is to leave too soon. If it was to stay too long in the past, now it seems it's to leave too soon. So if you're teetering on that edge this morning, could I say to you, don't be too hasty. Linger. But that brings us to the third word. And that is that in our day and time, there is help on almost every count corner, at every bookstore, in every church. There is help. There are those who will step into the chaos, into the brokenness, and who will bring the grace and the healing of Jesus to bear upon the situation. So while I say don't be too hasty, I don't just say that in a vacuum. I say have the courage. In fact, dare I say it, have the humility to get. I speak not just to couples. I speak to parents and children, to in-laws, to siblings. I speak to all of us. Because the reality is, commitment is the heart of the home. When you know that there is commitment among you as a family, that there is a place called home where you can go, and even if you have blown it, they will take you in and they will love you. There is nothing that gives you hope and life quite like that. So I speak to one and all. In fact, Maybe in a unique way, I speak to parents this morning because we are located on a university campus. I have, over the years of teaching here, come to realize that there are more than a few students who sit in our classrooms who don't know, who question, who are uncertain about the commitments their parents have to them. I've disguised and changed some details, but I speak of just one student. Years ago, in my earlier years in teaching, Here pursuing a profession, a very challenging profession in which this person did not want to be involved, but had come because parents had said, this is what you will be. And so here, struggling to try to keep their head above water, to just make it because of fear of mom and dad. But that wasn't enough. Mom and dad further said to the student, not only will you be this, but you will graduate in the top 10% of the class. Struggling, fighting, battling, and finally cheating to make it. Caught, expelled. And then mom and dad said, don't come home. We don't have a child who would cheat. So I speak to us all when I remind us of the words of a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. I'll stay with you to the very end, always. Oh, and that couple, that beautiful couple, are they beautiful because they're in love? Or are they in love because they're beautiful? What happens when the body begins to sag? What happens when the hair disappears? What happens to that word always? Well, I can tell you what happened with them. They have been married for 67 years. His body now ravaged by Parkinson's. Hers struggling with age. They still say, always. In fact, their older daughter and older son in particular are there day in and day out, always. I know that well because I call them mom and dad. Always. So here we are in the kitchen. Kitchen is the heart of the home. 
That's where we gravitate to for nourishment, for belonging, for nurture. But what's the heart of the relational, emotional, spiritual home? Could it be that it's that word, commitment? I know that I won't be alone because of these people. We have committed our lives to each other. And we'll be there always. I hope, I hope that you don't allow this week to pass without somehow making a choice to work it through, to address it, to face it, to change it, or to affirm it. Wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. And where you die, there I will die. And there will I be buried. Thank you.